Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning and happy St. Patrick's Day to all the Irish and wannabe Irish people out there. Numerous announcements here this morning, if you could bear with me. Um, we're now collecting candy for the Easter egg hunt, which is next Sunday after the Palm Sunday covered dish. Um, you can drop off individually wrapped candy in the office up until Friday of this week, and monetary donations are also appreciated for that. Uh, next week is the Palm Sunday um, covered dish, so if you are coming, please bring a covered dish or dessert with you. Um, there's also a bake-off uh, that Sunday school members are pro providing baked goods for. Also, Maundy Thursday is next Thursday, not this Thursday, but next Thursday, and that will be a Seder meal and communion, and uh, please consider attending that event as well. Softball season is upon us, and if you're over the age of 14 and want to have fun in fellowship, um, that is starting up very soon. As a matter of fact, March 24th, next Sunday at 4 o'clock is our first practice, and games begin already on April 14th. Kyle Fryman is our coach, and his number's listed in the bulletin. And it is a really fun event, and they take people of any skill levels, and I repeat, any skill levels. For instance, I've played for 20 years, so they take any skill level. And um, also, the Shepherd's Cafe, you have two more chances for that. You have this coming Wednesday and next Wednesday, March 27th, uh, for the Shepherd's Cafe for their remaining weeks. And also, volunteers are needed to make homebound and calls to homebound people and shut-ins, as well as elderly members of our congregation a few times a month. And if you're interested, please call the office or see Pastor Robert. And speaking of Pastor Robert, he now has an announcement for everyone. Uh, quick questions. First of all, um, how many of you like coffee? Raise a hand. Ooh, quite a few of you. How many of you love someone who loves coffee? All righty, perfect. We've got a lot of potential volunteers here. If you've noticed, there's a piece of furniture in the atrium. Um, we are going to be offering coffee in a coffee cart in the atrium. I believe we're going to start Easter Sunday. I'm recruiting people who would love to just be friendly and help people you know, get coffee so they can stick around before worship and stick around after worship. So I'm pretty excited about this. We'll be offering three different blends. If you'd like to be a part of this ministry, please let me know. If you have any complaints, John Seckler is the person you want to talk to. <laughs> All righty. Thank you.
Please rise for the call to worship. <clears throat> How shall we enter the house of the Lord? With songs of great praise and rejoicing. How shall we prepare ourselves to receive the blessings? With hearts, minds, and spirits that are open. Come, let us worship the Lord and bow down. Let us offer our praise to God who has redeemed us. Please be seated. The gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and trust in his mercy. Please join with me. Heavenly Father, the gospel of Jesus Christ is life to those who call upon his name. Yet there are still so many who do not believe and even more who have not truly heard. 
your great commission calls us to share Jesus with our hurting world. Yet we confess that we miss countless opportunities to bring God's loving message of salvation to others. Forgive us for shying away from the joy of this privilege. Renew in us a heart for the lost. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Open our eyes to creative ways of taking that next step to bless others with the hope of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. Please share a sign of peace with those near you and with the entire congregation. I invite the children to come forward at this time. All right, good morning. Oh, how are we doing this morning? All righty, are you glad to be here? All right, I'm glad to have you here as well. I love all the green. I brought with me some blocks. Do you like playing with blocks? No? Magnets. Well, you're going to play anyway, all right? I want us to see how high we can stack these blocks. Will you help me? No, I'm not joking. Come on, help me out here. Come on. All right. All right. Oh, that's not going to go very long. Oh, mm, mm. Evan, I don't know about that. Mm. Ooh. Now, there is a time limit to this now. <laughs> wow. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. That's very impressive. Look over there. Wow, look at it, it dropped. You all can have a seat. Thank you for your help. You know, Jesus once told a story about two fellas who went to worship. Jesus warned people that, you know, people who are really proud, prideful and brag a lot, Jesus says, if you really brag a lot about yourself, you're going to fall like these blocks. And so these two fellows went to church one day, and one guy came in and said, just started bragging about how good of a person he was, how righteous he was. He started talking about all the good things that he did. But a second fellow came to church. He was humble. He recognized just how much he needed God, just how much of, he has failed, and just how much he needed God's grace. God wants us to come to church with a posture of humility. 
Because if we come bragging and, and really proud, prideful, well, he can't come into our hearts and change us like he wants to change us. So I, I really want us to try really, really hard when we come to church, when we interact with our brothers and sisters, when we, when we approach our parents, kids at school, let's try to be humble. Because when we're humble, we're even more like Jesus. Would you bother me with our prayer? Eternal God, I thank you for these, these young persons. I thank you for the fact that they are here. They're excited to be here. And I pray that you would only perpetuate that excitement in the days before them. I ask that you would bless them and help us all to be humble. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. All righty. You all may have a seat.
The scripture reading is from the 19th book of John, beginning with the 28th verse. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. Thanks, Mike, for giving me uh, some batteries on my microphone, or else I would have had to use my outdoor voice, and that can get loud. Um, Would you bow with me in a word of prayer as we begin? Eternal God, this is your word, and we praise you for your faithfulness to every single one of your promises. We ask your spirit might help us to consider these things, help us to apply them. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, someone spotted him again. This time it was in Lynchburg, Virginia. A woman was walking the Black Creek Trail, listening to praise and worship on her phone when she spotted him on a rock formation. A local newspaper interviewed her, and she said, I was walking the trail and looked and said, Whoa, 
that looks like a face. And the more I looked at it, the clearer it became. That looks like Jesus. She says, do you see the nose, the shut eyes, the crown of thorns, uh, the bruised, puffy left eye, uh, the punched face, the beard, the mustache, the long hair? It's Jesus. Of course, she points out that you can only see it if you look at the rock formation a certain way. However, she exclaimed, the more you look at it, the clearer it is, and it's absolutely amazing. Now, when there are news feeds like that, I love to read the comments. There were a lot of people with words of celebration who said, one person said, that's amazing. There were also a lot of words that were criticism. One person said, if we don't know what Jesus looked like, how could we possibly recognize him? One man wrote, and I like this, Jesus is the rock. Spotting Jesus in the most unlikely places. We hear stories like the rock formation all the time. Jesus sightings in the strangest places. Jesus has been spotted on a tortilla, a Cheeto, a cinnamon roll, a potato chip, a grilled cheese sandwich, a Walmart receipt, and drying socks. I'm not making this up. Go on the internet. You'll see images of this. Spotting Jesus in the most unlikely places. You know, the most unlikely place Jesus Christ was ever spotted was the cross. No one expected that. And it's a season of Lent, and it's a time where we especially consider the cross. And we don't like dwelling on the cross. And that's why it's important that we take time to consider the seven statements Jesus made on the cross this morning. We're looking at the shortest. Now, if you've studied the book of John, John doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the physical suffering that Jesus endured. We don't read a detailed account of what Jesus experienced physically. The other gospel writers, they spend a little bit more time describing Jesus' physical suffering. And that's because his physical suffering is not the primary issue. You see, thousands and thousands of people were crucified. Persians are the ones who created the crucifixion. The Phoenicians, they adopted the crucifixion, and they crucified criminals and traitors. But it was the Roman Empire. They perfected the crucifixion. We don't read detailed descriptions of the thing Jesus endured on the cross because the Gospels writers want us to be reminded that It's the spiritual suffering of Christ. That's what's most important. Not the the physical suffering. doesn't matter. We should not gloss over the physical suffering of Christ. But the primary point is how Jesus suffered for our sin while he was on the cross. And if you remember from last week, from 12 o'clock noon till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there was darkness, there was confusion, there was this thick, oppressive silence throughout the land. Suddenly, the light shines, Jesus is at the point of near death, every, F, every breath that he takes is now an effort, he, he manages to speak, which in Greek is one word, in English is two. He says, I thirst. Now, now, the soldiers who were there, they grabbed a, a pail that they carried with them always. It contained a rather crude drink. It was sort of a con- this mixture of, of vinegar wine with water. It was the cheap drink of the day. It was a commoner's drink. It was a soldier's drink. And so the soldiers got the wine, took a sponge, dipped it in there, and put it on a stalk of hyssop. Hyssop. It's interesting that John... It, includes that detail. Because we hear of the term hyssop earlier in the Bible. When the Israelites, they marked their doorposts with the blood's lamb in order that the angel of death would pass over them, God instructed them to use a bunch of hyssop as a paintbrush. Hyssop is the crude device that the soldiers used to offer Jesus some relief from his thirst. Jesus took what was offered to him. It was just enough to moisten his throat, his tongue. It allowed him just enough moisture to make 
two more statements. He who is the water of life cried out, I thirst. Consider this. Jesus did not complain from what the gospel writers tell us. He did not complain about his physical suffering. When they put a crown on his head, he didn't say, ow, my head. When they struck him in the face, he didn't say, ow, my face. When they scourged him, he didn't say, ow, my back. But moments away from death, he cries out, I thirst. This is the only reference he ever makes to his physical suffering. Why did John include that? Well, he prefaces. He says, knowing that everything had now been finished, Jesus cries, I thirst. What does that mean? Well, Jesus knew that his work had been completed. He, he has bore the sins of humanity. He knew at that point he did everything he needed to do for you and me. It was, it was only after he accomplished his purpose. It was only after he cared for the needs of others. It was only after he promised paradise to the criminal. It was only after he took care of the well-being of Mary. It was only after he made the announcement of atonement that he mentioned his physical suffering. Jesus' statement, I thirst, proves that he was really human. Proves that he was a man. Now, now John is writing his gospel at a time when Gnosticism is on the rise. Gnosticism is this fusion of religious and philosophical thought. And one of the great tenets of Gnosticism in that day is that spirit is altogether good and matter, flesh, is altogether bad. They believe that God, who is spirit, could never possibly take on human flesh. Flesh is matter. Flesh is inherently evil. Therefore, Jesus could not have had a real body. And so the Gnostics would actually teach that Jesus, when he would walk on sand, he wouldn't leave a footprint because he didn't really have a physical body. And since God could never suffer, Jesus never suffered. He never experienced any pain while he was on the cross. That is what the Gnostics were teaching. They, they think they were honoring God with their teaching, but what they were doing was really destroying the gospel. And so Gnosticism is on the rise, and so John is writing his gospel in that environment where he wants to counter Gnosticism. He wants to correct their mistakes. And I believe John wants to show people that the pain Jesus endured on the cross was real. His humanity was real. His suffering was real. His feeling of abandonment was real. His thirst was real. It's so easy to forget Jesus' humanity. I, mean, I know it's hard to wrap our minds around God becoming flesh. But it's easy to forget that Jesus is a man. That he experienced life, joys, and sorrows. That Jesus experienced life's ups and downs. That Jesus experienced some of life's pleasures and he knew pain. You remember how he was tired in Samaria? How he was frustrated by the lack of faith? How he was hungry in the wilderness? How he grieved for John the Baptist? How he was angry at the temple, how he was sad over Lazarus' death, how he was anxious in the garden. And now he declares his thirst while on the cross. On the cross, Jesus is paying for our sin. He's taking our sin upon himself. But Jesus' words, I thirst, reminds us of the reality that Jesus is not only God's son, but he is also God in the flesh, that he is fully human. I think John wanted to include this part of the narrative as a means of helping us derive some source of encouragement and hope for we who suffer. Has your body been ever overwhelmed with pain? So is his. Have you ever felt like the weight of the world upon you? So did him. Have you ever felt mistreated? 
misjudged, misinterpreted, misunderstood. So did he. Have those nearest to you ever abandoned you? They did him. Have you ever felt alone in the darkness? So did Christ. Where can you go when you feel hopeless, when you're in pain, when you feel suffering? You can come to a Savior who has pierced hands and pierced feet. When your suffering seems unbearable, draw near to the Savior who said, I thirst. When Jesus said, I'm thirsty, he said this not only because of the agony he was suffering, he also said it so that scripture might be fulfilled. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, John says, so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. What scripture? Well, Psalm 69, verse 21. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. This wasn't the first time Jesus was offered a beverage while on the cross. The first time we read in the book of Mark, they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. He refused that drink. Why? Well, historically, Jewish women, they would offer this concoction, this drink, this beverage to numb the pain to help men get through the crucifixion. This drink would help deaden them to the enormity of the physical pain they were about to experience. They offered this to Jesus, but he said no. Why? I'm reminded of the movie Braveheart. Ever see the movie? While the historical accuracy is questionable, it's still a great movie. William Wallace is captured. He's accused of high treason. He's about to face unimaginable torture, hang, drawn, quartered. But Queen Isabella offers him something to deaden the pain. Do you remember the movie? He takes it, but after she leaves, he spits it out. He refuses it. He wants his mind sharp and alert. Again, the historical accuracy of the scene is questionable, but Jesus refusing the first drink is fact. The first wine was designed to deaden the pain, to keep him from experiencing the fullness of the pain of the crucifixion. Jesus refused. He chose to endure it fully. He wanted to be fully aware of the penalty and the weight of sin. But the second drink was not the same as the first drink. The second drink was not meant to deaden the pain because his work was finished. This drink didn't deaden the pain. It prolonged it. He drank the drink to fulfill prophecy. Max Lucado wrote in his book, He Chose the Nails. He says, why in the final moments was Jesus determined to fulfill prophecy? And there were at least 20 prophecies fulfilled just while Jesus was on the cross. Jesus was determined to fulfill prophecies because he knew we would doubt. He knew we would question. Lucator writes, and since he did not want our heads to keep his love from our hearts, he used his final moments to offer proof that he was the Messiah. God's prophecies should remove our doubts. And there are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Christ, that point to his life, that point to his ministry, that point to his death. And these prophecies were written hundreds of years before Christ even hit the scene. Prophecies that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be birthed by a virgin, that he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, that he'd be rejected by his own people, that he'd be betrayed by one of his own. Jesus fulfilled every one of these prophecies, and the list does not stop there. You see, according to the prophecies, the Messiah was to be struck and spat upon by his enemies, mocked and insulted, die a crucifixion, pray for his enemy. His garments would be cast in lots. His bones were not broken. 
What I'm getting at here is Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecy even while he was enduring the cross because he wanted to know that God's promises are trustworthy. God's promises are trustworthy. There is not one word of God that will fail to be fulfilled. There is not one promise of God that will fail to be brought into fruition. There is no obstacle that can ever thwart God's agenda. What God has spoken will come to pass. What God has purposed, God will do. God never makes a flippant promise. Even in agony, Jesus takes the time to ensure us of this. He wanted us to trust in the Word of God. He says, I thirst. Broken promises. Have you ever been on the receiving end of one? That's a rhetorical question. We all have. Broken promises. Have you ever been on the giving side of one? That's a rhetorical question, too. We all have. Why do people break promises? Why do we break promises? Sometimes people don't intend to keep their promises because they're dishonest. Sometimes people make promises they just can't keep. Sometimes people forget about the promises they make. God is different. Thank God, God is different. He makes a promise. He keeps it. This week I read about Gladys Alward. Gladys served as a missionary in China before World War II. When the Japanese army marched into northern China, she was forced to flee, and she took with her 100 orphans. A hundred orphans fleeing military occupation. And as she led the orphans through the mountains, she despaired for their safety. After a sleepless night, she was reminded by a 13-year-old girl of Moses. How when he and the Israelites faced an unimaginable rock between a hard place, God part of the sea. This 13-year-old reminded Gladys of that. And Gladys replied, I'm not Moses. Of course you aren't, this 13-year-old girl said. But God is still God. No matter what mountains may loom before us, no matter what crises we may face, no matter what confusion is on our circumstances, no matter how hopeless you might feel, God is still God. Do you feel squeezed by your circumstances? Dwell in the promises of God. Read the promises. Write them down. Remind yourself of them. Stand on his promises and do not let yourself be moved because every word of promise is a promise kept. Would you bow to a word of prayer this morning? Eternal God, we thank you for sending your son. And by sending your son, you pave the way for us to experience freedom. For as the Apostle Paul wrote, for freedom, Christ has, well, he has set us free. We thank you for what this means for us, for the hope that it instills within us. And God, we thank you that your ways are always far greater than our ways, how your thoughts are always far deeper than our thoughts. We thank you that even before we were created, you had a plan to redeem us. And God, we thank you that you make all things new. So God, help us 
to stay strong and true. God, help us to not follow after the voice of the crowd, but let us press on forward in solidarity with your spirit. And God, we thank you that you reign supreme. We are reminded of the words that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And let us continue to honor and praise and worship God this morning as we present our tithes and gifts.
Eternal God, we thank you that the one who said, I thirst, offers us living water. God, we thank you for your provision. And we present to you a portion of what you've given us. Oh, God, bless these gifts. May they further your kingdom on earth. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Now may our Lord, who has laid up for you a hope in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, keep you strong to the end, so that you'll be blameless on the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 